to your Sunday edition of Mailbag. I'm Perry, and joining me today is... <gasps> Mark Riley. Hi. Yay. I'm so excited. So good to always be here. Anytime I can be on Mailbag with P. Nimmy is a good day. I will express the same exact thing because I love doing mailbag with this guy right here, especially when there's some fun questions in the mix. So as you guys know, please send your mailbag questions to collidervideo at gmail.com. We go through and we pick them for our mailbag shows. We pick them for mailbag on Movie Talk. But one thing to note, we want some really original, crazy, zany, you know, outside the box type questions. We love talking about Star Wars, Marvel, DC, DCEU, all that good stuff. But, you know, there's there's room for creativity in there. Am I right? Am I right Absolutely. About that? Open up the, the conversation, discussion pieces. You know, these are things that we, we love film. We love movies. We love all encompassing everything. I mean, from Ocean's Eleven all the way to Aliens to Star Wars. You know what we like. How did like. you not say Jaws? How about Jaws? <laughs> oh, there. We just worked my Jaws reference into well Mailbag. Then. I will try to do a Jaws reference, though, in one of these questions because uh, it's made its triumphant return. Okay. The okay. Jaws reference. I can, I can live with that. Okay. All right. So I think we've got an interesting lineup for you today. Oh, the yeah. first question is... From Albert Rodriguez, who writes, I've seen Spider-Man twice now, and yeah. I really loved it. But one thing that really, oh, I should say before I read this question, that right. if you have not seen Spider-Man Homecoming, this involves one of the end credit sequences. So you might want to skip this and go on to question two, or you could stick around for the discussion, whatever you choose. But we are going to get into what that end credit scene is right now. So the question again, I... Have seen Spider Man twice now, and I really loved it. But one thing that really annoyed me was the second post credit scene with Captain America. What? I know you guys really thought it was great, but I hated it. Marvel has trained us to be somewhat. What is that word? I don't know what that. Somewhat Pavlovian. What's Pavlovian mean? Pavlov's dog. Uh, they've trained us with a bell to huh. do this, to wait. Pav Pavlo Pavlovian. Pavlovian. Pavlov's dog. You I'm ring a bell, be the dog it. wants a treat. I learned something new today. Thank there you, Riley, is. and thank you, Alba Rodriguez. So we we are Pavlon. <laughs> Jesus. Pavlovian. In viewing their movies, stay to the end for at least two more scenes. But when they basically told the audience, you just watched your time, sucker. You just wasted your time, sucker. That really annoyed me. There were some grumblings in the theater. I watched it in... I watched it in two. Don't you guys think this was giving the audience the bird, for flipping the audience the bird, for sticking around all the way to the end? I can tell you I'm not staying for the end of any more Marvel films now. Whoa. Pav Pavlo... Pavlovian. 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 Why can't I say it? I don't know. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create flashcards for you, though. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I've, I've been in two different situations with this now where okay. I have heard grumbling at the end when that happened, and then I've been in situations where people are getting a great laugh out of it. My, my opinion on the matter is I thought it was incredibly funny and I thought it was well done because it's not like this thing just came up out of the blue and they just threw it in in the ending. This is something that happens multiple times in the movie. So I thought it was a really clever callback to that while letting everybody have a laugh at the end. I understand that people stick around for the for the end credits to finish and it's five minutes of your precious time. But, you know, every once in a while, can't we just sit back and enjoy something for what it is? And I think that Marvel has given us enough end credit treatment to have earned the opportunity to make a joke like this. And also, one of my favorite things about end credit sequences is that it forces people to sit and watch all the credits because having me, if you have ever been a part of a production, you know how many people are responsible for bringing that thing to screen. And I kind of just love the idea of people having to sit there. And, you know, if you're not chit-chatting with your friends, you're staring at the screen and maybe a couple names might catch your eye. That's very true. And uh, let Albert... Don't stop waiting around for the Marvel uh, post credit scenes. You know why? Because you're going to get what you were looking for in the next Marvel movie and the one after that and the one after that. This fit for me in, it was so brilliant. I loved it, and I know you, you didn't like it, and I can respect your opinion. But this fit the tone of Spider-Man Homecoming. It fit it, – it, it was self-referential uh, in the fact that Marvel knows we're waiting there, and they made fun of themselves. They made fun of themselves. They were laughing with us. I was la I was dying when that came up, and I said that is one of the most brilliant 
uh, post credit scenes Marvel has ever done because it was so simple. Um, I believe John Watts said that they, you know, filmed a bunch of those PSAs mm-hmm. that are going to be on the Blu-ray, yes. and it kind of occurred to them that they could do that. And and again, you got the one post credit scene that did set up future movies, so you got your big one right. Mm-hmm. That's the one that you really look out for. And this one reminded me of Guardians of the Galaxy when you had Howard the Duck make an appearance. That didn't go in. We're not going to get a Howard the Duck movie. I don't think we're ever going to get a, a Howard the Duck movie uh, for years down the line. We could, but that was kind of in the same vein. It was really funny. You know, it was just a, like a throwaway. This is the same thing. And I thought, you got to let Marvel do that. They're have, they've given us so many movies, so many wonderful things. Why not have a little bit of a laugh? The whole patience thing was, it, it was brilliant. So, Albert, I just, I implore you. Don't just throw away the Marvel post credit scenes. Don't just leave the theater. Do what Perry says. Enjoy the, you know, look look for your name in the credits. Because I've seen Mark Riley's before. Really? Oh, yeah. He was a camera operator I've sometimes. I've never seen a Perry Nemiroff in any of those credits. It's kind of fun. I've seen, you know, my grandfather's name. I've seen, you know, my mother's name. You know, th- these are things you can do. You could also just kind of look and learn something about film with some of the positions, that, especially Marvel films. Oh, my God. Did you know there's so many things that go into the effects? So... It's really fun. I implore you to just Mm -hmm. stick around, wait, and let Marvel have their fun. You're going to have fun in the process. It's kind of what you said. I feel like it falls on one side of the line or the other where you watch something like that and it either comes across as, oh, it's Marvel left, like making a joke at their own expense, Mm -hmm. or if you take it as, oh, Marvel is laughing at us for having sat there, which is why I can understand why people might feel one way or the other. But again, personal opinions here. I loved it. You loved it. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see what they have in store for... For the next Marvel movies, I can't wait to sit through the credits and watch them again. For right now, though, Riley Granson writes, Good name. Hello, everyone. Greetings from Minnesota. I am generally not a fan of horror films, but in an effort to see everything in order to broaden my horizons, I check them out when I can. I recently got to see Wish Upon, and driving home, a thought crossed my mind. Is an R rating better for horror? The Bye Bye Man, Rings, and Wish Upon are all bad movies, in my opinion, but maybe given the opportunity to spread their wings, they could have gone deeper. I recognize there have been some good ones, i.e., the sequel to Ouija last year. What do you think? Thanks for taking my question. So I think you just answered your question. I I don't necessarily think an R rating is the problem in these cases. You name three bad movies. The Bye Bye Man is, I like the concept. It's not great. Rings was hugely disappointing. And uh, if you have seen my Wish Upon review, you know I think that's bad also. And in these three situations, I don't think making them R-rated would have made them any better. I think the problems with those three movies are execution and script problems. The ideas just, I mean, Wish Upon as an example, I think that is a brilliant idea that had a lot of potential and maybe in the hands of a different writer and a different filmmaker could have been a completely different movie. But just saying, oh, if you backtracked with that movie and made things made things bloodier, you know, more curses, more sex and all that stuff, I don't think that would have changed the film in a way that made it better. Right. I I totally agree with you. Um, It is all execution. It is story. I mean, just because it's a horror movie doesn't mean you slap an R rating on it and expect good things. You have to focus on story. You have to focus on characters. That's what makes good movies. Now, I could look at say, a Friday the 13th movie back in the 80s, okay? Let's sh- let's choose Friday the 13th, Part 7, The New Blood, right? Okay. R-rated, lots of sex, lots, lots of nudity, lots of cursing, lots of gore. That's where it kind of enhances the Friday the 13th experience, in my opinion, because you kind of come to expect that. Is Friday the 13th, Part 7, The New Blood, a good movie? Nope. Not, it, it's, it's, you know, it is what it is. I enjoy the hell out of it because I get all those fun tropes and the the R rating but you really do need to focus on story at the end of the day from what you said on about wish upon I haven't seen the movie but you you said something on Thursday's movie talk where there was an interesting like every reaction kind of get or what she wishes has um what, what am I looking for has repercussions, repercussions right yeah and you you compared it to um final destination that's an interesting idea also wish upon comes from a very famous story the monkey's paw what you wish for is going to have that repercussion on you. So they had the source material, not really, I mean, not monkey's paw per se, but they had a good starting off point. 
Sounds like the execution wasn't there. Yeah. So yeah. I don't think you know slapping more gore in there or 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 word or bad language or or anything like that is going to help that movie. You really got to focus on story end of day. I also think that decision needs to be made early on. Like I was trying to think of some examples where a movie needed its R rating, and the first thing that came to mind was something like Logan. Mm. But I feel like had Logan been in the hands of different writers and a different director, maybe it would have used that R rating to excess, where all the blood and violence might have taken away from the core story and all that character development we got. So you really never know. You just need to have the right mix of people, ideas, rating. I think if it's served a purpose it should be incorporated but an r rating is definitely not a leg up necessarily in the horror genre sometimes when you're put in that pg-13 box you're encouraged to have to make the most out of dramatic tension and things like that and sometimes those concepts can be just as scary as watching someone get their head chopped off here comes the jaws reference you look at <laughs> jaws okay and that is a pg movie mm -hmm. okay it wasn't pg-13 for the time it was pg because spielberg used Music, sound effects, he used not showing the shark, but like the perfect example is Chrissy at the beginning of the movie. He tied her up underwater on these rigs and the people pulled her and you got the sense mm -hmm. the shark was there. That's a perfect use of, you didn't see gore. I mean, it originally was supposed to be very gory. You're supposed to see the shark. You're supposed to, if you read the book, man, she gets, it's not good. And, but because he was able to use his directing techniques, that really told the story, it was more terrifying than anything you could ever see, like blood out of the water mm -hmm. or whatnot. That is a perfect example. And Logan, I think, is a great example, Perry, because it sets the tone for the movie. I just rewatched it the other night. That opening scene it's where the so guys good. are stealing the hubcaps and he just has to defend himself and it becomes brutal and gory that sets the tone for this is a very different movie very different logan and you're like oh my god we are at the end of the road with this guy and it is brutal and it kind of foretells foreshadows the end of the movie with that first scene in my opinion oh you make me want to watch logan again oh i want to watch it now. all right question number three comes from mike who writes hello collider crew my question is about comic book movie love interests why do you feel as though every comic book movie has to shoehorn in a romantic plot there have been exceptions to this but for the most part every comic book movie almost immediately introduces that franchise's premier love interest and then they're together why haven't the studios in introduced a character and tried to build on the relationship through the movie. Marvel has been great at building a multi-character universe by putting tiny pieces of a much larger story into their franchises franchise movies but haven't figured out the love story i mean did thor really need a girlfriend thanks for taking my question do you want to take this one first i yeah this is a great question because uh let's use marvel because i can see two examples where um one paid off and one didn't okay you already brought up one thor yeah mm -hmm. the thor relationship was really forced it almost felt like uh yeah here's a love interest for the sake of the love interest and that is inherent in every story you usually have a love story going on in some form it's all execution and storytelling but for me the best marvel love story is pepper Potts and tony stark that was over three movies even four movies with avengers even spoiler alert should we do a spoiler alert do we need to or I should just check out? No, yeah. I can't even go there. I can't even go there. Okay, let's see. Their let's love story a isn't that over. That never happened. No, no. His, I haven't even met, mentioned the movie. Th their love story isn't done. That's what I love. It's something that was introduced in Civil War. And if you keep watching Marvel, it is keep it, it, it keeps being developed. And the writing is brilliant. I think it really took off in Avengers when Joss Whedon set up that whole first scene where um, – uh, where uh, why can't I remember his name? Clark Gregg. What's his name now? He's been uh, gone Coulson. so long. Colson comes in and talks to Tony and Pepper, mm -hmm. and that relationship there was like, yeah, I had twelve percent of a moment. That is a great love story. Mm -hmm. So I think it's done well in there. It's all the execution. Yeah, I think part of the problem is just having earned relationships because in most of these movies you got a guy and you got a girl and just because they're there they're pretty and they're both single you kind of expect that to happen and mm -hmm. often that's almost used as a way to skip over exposition and just make it happen and that's when it doesn't really work mm -hmm. and I think I mean hands down one of the worst MCU relationships is definitely Thor and Jane that it's, drove me nuts it did, and yeah. and I also didn't like um, Sharon Carter and Steve Rogers I didn't think oh. that's actually the perfect example of a shoehorned uh, romance where there were okay actually another reason that it's very challenging to pull off 
romance in these types of superhero movies is because often there are so many more interesting, exciting things going on than people hooking up for the first time. I think one of the few exceptions to that rule is Deadpool, where that romance was done in a way where that is so key to his character. It's key to who he is and it's key to who he becomes and it's woven in so well and holy shit their chemistry in that movie I think the combination of things like that makes it work I think you can only have romance in these types of movies when it's justified and really any movie for that matter but I I just hope that we don't have many more things like Thor and Jane and I don't know what they're gonna do with with Steve and Sharon right now and you know, I mean, we also have Black Widow and Hulk. It's like, why Why do they all have to get together? I don't really get that. You know, I'm kind of, di- I mean, I can kind of, I'm almost disagreeing with you with the Sharon Carter and, yeah. or not Sharon, uh, Peggy Carter and oh, Captain Pe- America. Well, Peggy Carter and Captain America is a completely different story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, which, uh, Peggy from, yeah. from First That's Avenger. That's a good relationship. Yeah, Civil I see what War you're with saying. Sharon, uh-uh. Got it. I, I, I misunderstood. Yeah, the, the first, the first Avenger. That was kind of ooh. That was very. Uh, it it led to that story being pretty heartbreaking, and uh, I'm very. It it worked for me. Sharon, I get it. They kind of set it up in Winter Soldier and then paid it off in Civil War. But yeah, felt shoehorned in. I think your Deadpool uh, reference is spot on because that helps the story. That's in, an integral part of the story, which is always the key to to making these things work. All right. Question number four comes from Gabriel Del Romano, who mm. writes. Hi, Team Collider. I'm such a big fan of your work. I never miss an episode. What do you think about all these Disney and Pixar animated sequels that are coming up in the next few years? In 2018, we have The Incredibles 2 and Wreck-It Ralph 2. And in 2019, Toy Story 4 and Frozen 2. It's such a bummer because Disney and Pixar animated films to me have always represented originality. And I want to see new ideas instead of more sequels following the trend of the rest of the industry. I I agree with it to a point. Mm Mm-hmm. I definitely look at both Disney and Pixar as anime. I mean, they're they're under the same umbrella, but in and of themselves, Disney Animation and Pixar, they have both done such a great job embracing things that may come across as risky to others, where it doesn't feel like they're just putting a movie out there to, to earn some quick cash, to get some quick smiles. They're always thoughtful, inventive, and visually inventive films, too. They've had some of the greatest achievements in animated technology I've ever seen, and I definitely applaud them for taking those risks and trying to pave the way for companies. I mean, like Laika, who is also taking big risks and right. exploring new territory. But at the same time, there are situations that I think do call for sequels. The Incredibles 2 is definitely one that I want. I think as long as you wrap up a movie where there is a reason to explore the next chapter of those characters' lives, it's fine. I'm willing to hold off on an original property in order to get that. I want it with Incredibles 2. And even more so, I think I want it with Wreck-It Ralph too, because that to me is the perfect example of how you had such great world building in Wreck-It Ralph 2. And when you incorporate the internet, Ralph breaks the internet. That is so interesting and exciting to me. And it opens the door up to so many more visual possibilities. Yeah, I agree. It, it, it is, uh, you can look at maybe Toy Story 4 is one of those stories where when Toy Story 3 came out, how to train your dragon came out the same mm-hmm. year and i saw how to train your dragon and fell in love with that movie and that was another story that i can't wait for the, the third movie so i went oh my god nobody's going to beat how to train your dragon and then toy story 3 came out and it was <sighs> heart wrenching it was beautiful it was a wonderful end to a trilogy so when i heard toy story 4 that's where i went yeah that's a little hard for me to wrap my head around yeah. because we have a perfect trilogy with toy story but you said it with Incredibles, it's superhero movies are, are like based on the old serials. You know, these are movies that can continue to go. They can end on a cliffhanger with some superhero movies can do. Incredibles 2 set it up perfectly with mm-hmm. the end. It looks like maybe they go right in to fight, fighting the Underminer. We don't know. We don't know if that's going to be what happens with Incredibles 2. But I understand your point. We do have Inside Out. Inside Out is mm-hmm. one of the best Pixar original movies I have ever, ever. seen. Ever. And they're going to continue to do that. But like you said, Perry, if there's a story that that can be told with sequels, Pix, especially Pixar and Disney, they're not going to do it cheap. They're not. It, this is not a you know wish upon two or something that's going to be say it. Don't thrown say out it, there to, to, to capitalize on the brand name. Ugh. 
Uh-huh. This is something that takes years of development, years of storytelling, years of outlining this thing. So I trust them with doing that. So we will have more sequels. I get Frozen 2. I don't know about. Yeah, I don't Frozen know Frozen 2. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of with you I on that. Loved. It, it I loved it. It is possible Frozen. to love a movie and not want more of it. Frozen to me was just so incredibly satisfying. Yeah. Just in and of itself. Yeah. Let it live there. And same thing with Toy Story 4. Yeah. That is such an incredible. I just rewatched that whole trilogy. So we do beautiful. not need. It was such a beautiful ending. It was such a beautiful ending that when you go back and you watch the first one now and you think about where they're going to end up, it means so much more. Oh, don't do it. Yeah. But then again, I trust them. I mean, why would they want to tarnish such a great brand? It's it's a great question <laughs> because, yeah, you, you, you trust them. So you hear Frozen 2 and Toy Story 4 and go, well, they must have something. But at the same point with Frozen and Toy Story 3, they're, they're, especially Frozen, that's a, that was a great story. It was a great story about two sisters, and we're done. So I don't know if we need a, a second one. We'll see what happens. But don't worry. Disney will continue. Disney and Pixar will continue to do original movies. Sometimes we just have to wait a little bit longer because there are more stories to be told with these sequels. I think that's well said. All right, we have time for one more question from okay. Joe, who writes, Hello, Collider gang. Keep up the great work. Your entire cast and crew for Collider Movie Talk has an outstanding chemistry. If you all were to be cast together for a movie, what type of movie would it be? I could see everyone in a remake of Clue, but Ooh. I can also see a sort of Ocean's Eleven ensemble. Ooh. What type of movie do you all see yourselves making together? Let's pretend the budget is not a concern to make this question open-ended for all genres. Okay. I love this question. The first que- the first movie that came to mind, because I could kind of see us being like a fun-loving slash zany and like bumbling group going on an adventure. Is, Which we are. Is Goonies. Oh my God, yeah. I, and I try. I started to try to like you know like fan cast everyone and i don't even know if this is so accurate but i put you as mikey i was gonna say i have to be mikey i I think you're definitely the mikey type because like you're you're a leader but you know you're you're not a leader that's that's like overbearing and like you're you're like a a very good team player and i feel like that was one of mikey's best assets i just picture makuga being brand because i can picture him in that whole outfit (laughs) very Um, true uh, my older brother, for those who haven't seen Goonies, I would be Mikey and Bran would be Josh McCuga, the older brother that is a jock. <laughs> Perfect. It's very appropriate. Perfect. I, I put Ellis's mouth because, of course. you know, Ellis can talk. And then the only other one that I, I settled on that I felt, oh, two actually. First one that I settled on and felt confident about was I put Thad as Data <laughs> just because I feel like <laughs> Thad would, I don't know, he'd come up with some sort of solution, like a like a tool to fix a problem and he would just like take it out of his pocket and save the day. I don't know. Yeah. And then the other one, this this is I, I can't tell if this is crossing the line, but for Steph, I put Ken because she's just like you know like wah wah. <laughs> <laughs> so I just envisioned Ken in that role. Riley, I think he would probably right be okay. Well, okay, okay. Uh, my movie. Okay, the first one that came to my head, no kidding, was Aliens. I would love for the Collider crew, not love, I mean, let's let's just say it's a movie, so we're playing with Monopoly money of uh, make-believe. This is not a real thing. I don't want aliens to land on Earth, and then it's us against them. I kind of do. But if we, that'd be fun. <laughs> but if we were to be the, uh, the Marines, okay? okay, and we're with our backs against the wall, and there are some crazy H.R. Geiger aliens <laughs> breaking through, okay, we would have to then band together with weaponry and oh, with yeah. smarts and we would take on those aliens and we would take them down and you know what let's nuke them from orbit it's the only way to be sure oh i kind of love that idea i want to see something like this play out yeah i don't All know right. who would be cast though I, that that would be i think christian the christian would be hudson game over man game over he just christian lose it. Is definitely he would just hudson. lose it at one point <gasps> he would get like especially if he wasn't fed on time because he, he gets the hunger monster so if he's not properly fed it's game over <laughs> Dewey so can be Jones yeah Dewey could be Jones and then uh, Cal is Newt oh my god we have to rescue Cal I, I want to see this movie so oh, yeah. badly oh, oh my yeah. god one can dream thank you guys so much for watching this Sunday edition of Mailbag one last reminder send those super inventive questions on over to collidervideo at gmail.com so this guy has some interesting things to read mm. thank you guys so much for watching before we close out Mark Riley where can everyone find you you can find me at Riley around on Twitter and Instagram and like Perry said yeah guys send us in some awesome questions we don't mean to like poke fun at uh, you know the questions we do get what we're trying to do is start a discussion and we want to hear from you to do it so thanks so much mm. and you guys can catch me on Twitter and Instagram Instagram at PNemra. 
off. Don't forget, go back to yesterday's uh, episode of Collider Behind the Scenes. Give that a watch. I hope you guys have been enjoying our D23 coverage. We have so much Comic-Con coverage planned next week. So keep watching the channel. Keep refreshing. You're going to be blown away by how many videos we're going to have mm -hmm. out of that event. And I'm so excited to be down in San Diego. I cannot wait. I hope you can't wait. I was about to say, awesome oh, tacular. I'm not going to do that because now I'm in impression mode. But you know what? That's it for this edition of Mailbag. We will see you guys real soon.